Um, okay, uh, good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. It feels uh, really amazing to see the entire TESO family coming in together for another uh, webinar series. And I, on behalf of the Department of English, uh, welcomes and thank each individual for your valuable time and support that you have shown for this webinar today. And before I proceed on, uh, I would like to brief you about the reason why we came up with this uh, topic. So we know that uh, we Nagas, uh, the Sangha Society, uh, we're generally considered uh, to be people of oral tradition and we have been endowed with rich uh, oral tradition which have been passed down from generation to generation through words of mouth. However, we can also not deny the fact that uh, a society can never remain unchanged or untouched by the intrusion of modernity and this uh, becomes vulnerable for the preservation of such oral tradition. So we came up with this uh, idea in order to preserve our culture, tradition, and solely to relive uh, the storytelling moments that we enjoyed in the past and uh, rarely do these days. And um, I hope that we will all have a wonderful session together because I assure you that we have some amazing storytellers from amongst the students uh, and uh, with their uh, beautiful folk tales. Um, in the list. So I hope that we will all have a wonderful session together and uh, enjoy this uh, webinar together. So without taking much time, I would hand over the rest of the time to the first participant, that is Alam Nepal. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Alam Nepal Kongsai, and I am a fifth semester student in Tetsu College. I am currently pursuing my Bachelor of Arts in English Honors. First of all, I want to thank the Department of English for organizing such an amazing service, such an amazing program, and giving me the opportunity to share with you one of my favorite folk tales. This folk tale is the, it belongs to the Kuki community, Kuki tribe, which is my tribe, and uh, it is about two brothers, namely Lindo and Tang Hao. I was told about this uh, folklore when I was just a young child by my grandparents and my mother and when my paternal grandmother was was alive she swore that this story was real that lindo and tang hao actually existed and well the story here goes the story not too long ago a widow called ting nam lived with two of her sons tang, uh, lindo and tang hao uh, they were very poor and they, li they lived a life of poverty and, it, and uh, society was very male dominated during those times. It was a patriarchal society. So given that uh, Lindo's mother Ting Nam was a widow and Lindo and his brother Tang Hao, they were fatherless and they were, they were financially very poor. They did not receive a lot of respect in their community, in the society. Even Lindo and Tang Hao's peers would not even uh, give them respect and would not treat them as equal. They did not even uh, want to play games with them be because uh, they were fatherless. Uh, and Ting, Ting Nam, she would spend her days looking for jobs, uh, begging for jobs from her neighbors, uh, her loved ones, so that she can get, uh, she get so that she gets food in return, food to feed herself and her children in return. While children of Lindo and Tang Hao's age should be, would be having fun, playing games, enjoying their life because they were, they were so young. Uh, Lindo and Tang Hao would be obeying their mother and they would do chores like picking firewood from the forest, fetching uh, water from, from far away ponds. That was their life. To the world, their house was uh, in a terrible condition. To the world, their house was basically an unlivable mess. But to the children, it provided them with a place of comfort and solace. And every it, it provided them with comfort and they would sleep and rest well throughout the night. That was the kind of life that they led. 
uh, Ting Nam, the mother, was very much tired of the life that she was living. And she would always talk to herself. She would think of how she would... Uh, how it would, uh, it would be possible to escape such a life. So, one early morning, she sent her two sons to fetch water from uh, the pond. A man, a man called Pakil, came over to their house. And the man uh, started to woo Ting Nam, the widow. He started to compliment her, talking about her beauty and how her beauty is being wasted, living such a poor life. And he proposed Ting Nam. He proposed Ting Nam and he asked her to elope to him, to run away with him. And he gave, he gave her time to make the decision. That night, Ting Nam could not sleep at all. She spent uh, the, the whole night thinking of how, uh, thinking of how her life will be better thinking of how her standard of living would instantly improve if she married Pakil. So uh, th the next morning, Pakil came over again to inquire about Ting Nam's decision. He urged uh, Ting Nam to make a final decision, uh, final decision uh, while the kids were out doing their chores. Ting Nam succumbed to her greed, her desires to lead a better quality of life. She agreed to run away with him. Um, she came up with a very devious plan. In those days, uh, uh, people would use bamboo, bamboo to store water, to carry water. So Ting Nam drilled holes, small holes at the bottom of the bamboo vessels. And when her children returned home, she sent them out again to fetch water from the pond. The children were very, very much unaware of their mother's plans, their, her intentions. The children went to fill water in the pond and with the time in her hands, Ting Nam, she packed all her belongings and she ran away with her now boyfriend, Pakil. The poor kids, they had no, <clears throat> no idea what their mother had done. They kept on trying to fill the water, but uh, they kept on failing. Uh, they would return halfway because they would suddenly realize that their water vessels had become so much uh, lighter, suddenly lighter. So they would return back to the pond to fill the water again. And this happened several times. Uh, so while they were at the pond refilling the bamboo water vessels to the brim again, a woman came and informed them saying that while you guys are working, you, while you boys are working, your mother has uh, run away with her lover. She has run away with her boyfriend. The two children could not believe the woman, the news. They could not believe that their mother could do something like that to them. And they started crying. They started shouting, especially the younger brother, Tang Hao. He started crying uh, because he did not want to be away from his mother. Uh, they they raced back home, leaving their bamboo vessels at the pond, and they were searching for their mother. And they were they cried even more when they realized that their mother was no longer home, that all her belongings were nowhere to be found. And they started crying and talking to themselves, uh, and started saying that how could mother, how could you do this to us? How can you leave us all alone, hungry, helpless? And then a man, a man out of nowhere, hurt them crying uh, he uh, inquired the reason the boys told the man the reason and upon learning uh, the reason the man told the boys that oh your mother must have headed towards the village that is situated across the river why don't you head towards the river uh, and he also gave another additional advice saying that if your mother and her lover have already crossed the river uh, you two should return home because if you try to cross the river, the currents of the river will uh, take you away and you will die and that you will drown because of how strong the river currents are. The, the two boys started crying louder and they raced across the forest to the river and they were so tired and so hungry because they had been working before sunrise 
and now now their mother had run away with her lover and they were crying and when they reached the river uh, they saw the two lovers her uh, their mother and her boyfriend they were already across the river and L lindo the older brother shouted mother 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 how can you do this to us why have you left us all alone, hungry and helpless? And then uh, Tang Hao, the younger one, started crying, Mother, take us with you. Take us with you. The two lovers heard their cries and shouts. And the boyfriend, Pakil, told Ting Nam that it is not possible to take the kids with them. Ting Nam was in a dilemma now. Uh, after much deliberation, she decided, she reached a decision. She shouted over to Lindo. Lindo, uh, she said, Lindo, your, your younger brother is way too young to live in somebody else's house. Let the uh, strong current of the river take him away and you cross the river and come be with me. Lindo stood aghast. Uh, he could not believe what his mother had said, that their own mother had said, their own flesh and blood had said. Uh, Lindo could not believe that their mother uh, could even think of killing off his younger younger brother. Um, Lindo rejected his mother's proposal and he said, Mother... If that is your decision, just go ahead. Don't return. Don't even think about us. Don't think about us anymore. Don't think about us anymore. And then uh, the two lovers went away and Lindo, uh, Lindo's younger brother, Tang Hao, started crying even more. They started crying even more and Lindo carried, uh, gave his younger brother a piggyback ride home and they headed home. They knew, they knew that their home would now be empty and there would, will no longer be a mother figure in their lives. They were crying and mourning the loss of a mother figure from their lives. When they reached home, there was nothing, uh, no food available to eat. They were starving and they say that a man is a beast when hungry. And these kids, they were young and they were so young, they did not even, uh, they, were, they were not mature enough to even understand the gravity of the situation, but uh, they, they were left all alone in their house. They had nothing to eat. They kept on searching for food and they, uh, they found a stack of hay. They found a stack of hay and they rummaged through the haystack and finally after a while of searching for food they found a small tiny grain of millet a millet a tiny grain of millet and a, a small grain of millet is not enough to feel even one person it's not enough to feel a baby even but the two brothers divided the small grain of millet into two pieces and savored it deliciously uh, till now, parents, uh, my mother uses this story as an example to teach me and my sister the importance of sharing and loving each other, especially uh, to cultivate love among us siblings. And many, there are many cookie parents that use this story as an example to teach their children. Uh, that is the story and that is my presentation. And now I give the time to the next presenter. Good afternoon, everyone. My my name is Nchilu Shijo of BS second semester pursuing English as my major paper. The folk tale I will be narrating is titled as The Tragic Sorcery. It is believed to be a true story passed down from generation to generation of the Chakasan tribe. The tale is of an old widow who lived long ago in the village of, in the prospering village of Kusomi, 
Her name was Kanimutulu and she was believed to be sorceress. She was old and she could not work in the petty field anymore and she spent her every day at home. Back then it was a tradition a tradition for the old people who stayed back at the village to look after the children while the parents go for go to work for agriculture. The parents would beg the food of the children and bring them to the old lady to babysit while they go to work. When the children bring their when the children bring their foods, the old lady kept it on a table, on a large wooden table, and she would twist the neck of the children and remove the head out of the body uh, and keep it in a basket one by one. And she would continue with her works of spinning cotton and weaving without the interruption and disturbance from the children. The old widow, since she could not work, she she could not work and she did not have any food. She takes the uh, small portion of every food from every packed food and keep it to herself to eat. Mm, by the evening, when it is time for the parents to return from work, the, the old widow would put back the head of the children to their body and tells them to eat the food that the parents have packed for them. And when the when the children return home, they would complain that they have a very sharp pain in their neck and it went on and on. The, the children kept complaining, so the parents became concerned and decided to find out the cause of the pain. One day, when the parents left off the children at the widow's place, uh, they did not leave for work but stayed hidden behind the house to find out what really happens to their children. To their horrific surprise, the parents saw that the, the old widow removed their head, the children's head, and keeps it aside. And since the discovery, the, they stopped leaving their children for the old widow to babysit. That is the end of the story. Thank you. Now I give time to the next presenter. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Cynthia Zerzele, and I'm from BA fourth semester, taking up English as my honors paper. Today, I will be narrating a folk tale from the Zilangrong Naga tribe. Um, folk tales are also called as harassam in our dialect, and the folk tale that I'll be narrating has been taken from this book, Roots, a collection of Zilang Naga folk tales, written by Mr. Kangzang Ding Tong. And uh, the title of my folk tale is How the Dog Became a Domestic Animal. It is a very simple story and I hope you enjoy it. So here it goes. One day, the dog decided to follow the elephant because it thought that the elephant was the mightiest animal on earth. And uh, the, together, the elephant and the dog roam around the forest and wander through many places. However, when the dog started to bark, the elephant stopped the dog and said, If you bark, the tiger will find our whereabouts and it will come and kill us. So the dog was disappointed on hearing this and realized that it was not the elephant but the tiger who was mightier. So the dog left the elephant and went on to follow the tiger. The tiger and the dog now roam around many places and they wander through the forest. However, again, when the dog started to bark, the tiger stopped the dog and said, If you bark, man will find us and he'll come and kill us. Disappointed again, the dog realized that it was not the tiger, but man who was mightier. So the dog left the tiger and went on to follow man. Now together, man and the dog wandered through many places and roam about the forest. This time, however, when the dog started to bark, man did not stop him or restrain him from barking. Instead, man simply said, Well done. If you bark from time to time, everyone will know that we are here and they'll run away from us. Hearing this, the dog was pleased and was happy and finally assumed that, indeed, man was the mightiest of all the animals 
and the dog would find comfort and security from men. So uh, from that day onwards, the dog started living with men and became man's most faithful follower. Uh, that's the end of the story. And I've just narrated to you the Zilangrong version of how dogs came to live with men and became a domestic animal. Thank you. Now I'll give the time to the next narrator, Bendang Kaba. Hi everyone, my name is Bendang Kaba in Chen Ao from BA second semester, taking English honors. Today I would like to share you a beautiful folk tale that has been passed down from generations. So, um, this folk tale was told to, be, uh, told to me by my mom and it helped me to learn a lot of good lessons in my life. So I hope that this uh, folk tale will help you as well. So it begins with uh, the village of Chungdia, that is my village. There lived a happy family. The family consisted of four members, the father, the mother, and two daughters. The daughters were named as Long Pak Lung Shi and Song Jun. So Long Pak Lung Shi was the elder sister. She was 12 years old, and Song Jun was the younger sister, and she was 10 years old. So basically, they were very young. So they loved their parents so much, but unfortunately, one day uh, their mother passed away. So the father was uh, the father. One uh, after uh, the mother passed away, the father wanted to marry to another woman. She fell in love with a woman, and he wanted to marry her. So he asked the woman for a marriage proposal, but. The woman declined his proposal because he have already two daughters. So uh, the woman declined his marriage proposal. So and the reason for his uh, her declination was because he already have two daughters. So that was the reason. So the man was really sad over the fact, and then he wanted to. Uh, he w he suddenly went to a conclusion, and he took uh, one fine day. He took the two daughters to a forest, and told them to dig a hole. Uh, in the ground, on the ground, and when they finally dug the hole to the ground, uh, he, the man, uh, the father chopped the head of the two daughters and buried them in the very hole. After that, he went back to the house, uh, to the home, and then told, uh, called the woman and told her that he had got rid of his own daughters. Hearing this made the woman terrified about the man, and she got scared for what uh, he had done to his own daughters. And she told the man that, how could you kill your own daughters? This is beyond human, uh, human uh, as a human being. So she declined the man's proposal, and she went away. After that, the man was left with... The man was left with emotion, and he was really uh, he he was filled with anxiety, and he was regretting for what he had done. He was uh, he was regretting for for his own decisions, and then he went back to the very place for uh, where he had killed his own daughters, and he laments over the fact for his kill. Uh, this story this story tells us about how human beings are selfish and greedy for for our needs. Even though we have the things which people love us, we tend to get, uh, we tend to try to get more and more things in our life. Say, for example, in our present, in our present situation, <clears throat> from some sources we get to know that some of the current leaders are trying to get money through this uh, pandemic, through this virus. So this shows that people are still greedy. Back back from then, until now we have the same habit and we are still very greedy for for everything. Like even if we have things we tend to get more and more. We try to get more and more and we are never satisfied satisfied for what we get in our life. So we should never try to do uh, we should try to avoid that and we should try to eliminate our greediness, our selfishness in our uh, mind and soul as well. So now with that I end it and I give time to Vili both to her for her to present. Thank you. Good afternoon everyone. My name is Vili Bo Chishi from BA fourth semester, Department of English. The folklore I am going to narrate is based on our Sema tribe and is basically about two sisters. The 
folklore was narrated by my parents orally and it has been found from our ancestors. Because I would like to thank our, our English department for the opportunity given back to the story. Actually, there one is attorney content actually of a husband, a wife and two beautiful daughters. Their young daughters were so dear to their parents. However, their li the lives of the young girls abruptly took an ugly turn when their mother parted away and the father had to remarry. Unfortunately for the, for the girls, their stepmother never, never loved them and often mistreated them. They were seen as mere slaves and not as daughters. The helpless father could do nothing but watch as his new wife mistreated his daughters. It so happened that the eldest daughter had grown matured enough to notice out her life as a daughter and also as a daughter in the family and also boldly stood against all kinds of evils that their stepmother had released upon them, which again further angered the stepmother even more. Now, the stepmother's hatred for the eldest daughter knows no bonds. Therefore, she would frequently instigate the husband to get the eldest daughter killed. The evil stepmother further threatened the husband that she would leave him if he does not kill the child as early as possible. The helpless and puppet-like husband finally made up his mind to kill his child. So it was one fateful morning that the father had asked the eldest daughter to stake up some food and brew or drink for they were going hunting and fishing. The poor child, unaware of his father's hideous intentions, happily did as she was told and so they set off. The father, with a heavy heart, headed straight toward the jungle with his child. The father had intentionally brought the child into a dense forest, miles and miles away from home, as she was foreign to that very place. Hence, uh, she would never find her way back home. A minute later, father started digging a pit deep enough and making sure nobody could escape. Soon after the pit was dug, the father and the child had their last meal. They he then asked the child to get inside a pit and wait for his return. Alas, he never returned. Nevertheless, the father headed back home alone, leaving the child behind. Days passed. The youngest daughter became quite suspicious and was so much worried where about her sister. It was one fine morning, the youngest one picked up some food and drinks and she decided to go in search of her sister. She, she was encountered by a wild dog on her way into the dense forest who led her straight to the spot where her sister was trapped. She found her sister battling between life and grave, fatigued and famished and without proper air. After administering special care and feeding her with the food she brought, the elder sister regained necessary strength and managed to crawl up the pit. They spent time, some time embracing with one another until the younger sister had to head back home, but alone, keeping in mind not to let the parents caught them. So the younger sister was clever enough to convince the parents to get her uh, a pair of every traditional attire of Sumis. We call it Tony, Anche, Mini, etc., and other ornaments and jewelries for herself as well as for her sister. The parents would fulfill her demands and wishes since she was the only heiress left. So for about a week, the younger sister had been bringing food into the woods for. Uh, for her sister without the parents' knowledge. So it was this one day when their parents were out on the field, the youngest sister took her attires and ornaments, prepared the food wrapped on a plantain leaves, 
and both fled to other regions far, far away from home. On their journey, they discovered a kiki or an underground source of fresh water or a stream. So during the early times and before discovering the source of fresh water by these sisters, the ancestors were believed to extract and collect the drops of water from this specific plant uh, named Arupa or Calamas, Calamas Rotang, a species of game. So the girls also came across a very striking plant yielding this green red object. Out of starvation, the eldest sister, she decided she would try out if that thing or plant was eatable. So the moment she took a mouthful, it inflamed her mouth resulting in sudden heartburn with sweat. The younger sister was panicked, seeing her sister in that state. Before long, the elder sister had recovered. Uh, hence, from then on, uh, on, on, the plant was named Miramishi or Mirishi in Semada Sumi dialect, which means meat for an orphan, which we also use as chili or pepper in the present day. Finally, they came to this small village behind the valley. The villagers were kind enough and gave them a small plot of land. One day when they were about to shove off for work, they saw an elderly man knocking doors to doors for shelter. The elderly man was erectly dressed and had a leprosy. Since he was such in he was in such a pathetic state no villagers bothered to entertain him. Lastly, this elderly man came up to the young girls who happily invited them though they had nothing to offer. So this old man was actually believed to be a deity, spirit deity of our ancestors disguised as a sick old man. So the, this old man then asked the sisters to prepare a meal for them to which the younger sister reluctantly replied that they had nothing to eat. So, however, uh, he insisted them to keep the water boiling. Then the old man first shook his knees and knees, and to their astonishment, the pot of the herd was filled with rice and began boiling. Again, the, uh, the second time as the old man shook his elbow, Pieces of raw meat started to fill up the pot of boiling water out of blue. Then they cooked and add it to their satisfaction. satisfaction. Uh, the next day, the old man asked the young girls to show him their field. The young girls were reluctant as they were, their field was way too small. Yet, yet on being insisted again, they showed him their tiny field of hengu which we call pumpkins, the old man pronounced the blessings to their field and told them to stock, uh, stock up all the pumpkins into their granary. Without leaving one, they did as were well instructed to them. After that, he asked whether all the pumpkins had been stored. The youngest sister replied that she had left one pumpkin behind as it was too heavy for her to carry. So she was told to hurriedly bring the pumpkin back as soon as the pumpkin was stored with the others, all the pumpkin started uh, bursting out. Out of this pumpkin which bursted, bursted came out different varieties of crops and grain seedlings which we use till death. The sisters show, uh, the sisters sowed their seeds of grains and had a bountiful harvest. Soon, the sisters came, became rich and prosperous. They often helped the villagers in need, but the, uh, the old man was never to be seen again. So, according to this legendary myth, the present crops or grains that we cultivated came out from the pumpkin which bursted that day. The moral of the story is the sisters were bold and strong, though, though they were abandoned and forgotten by their own parents. This 
also show their indomitable spirit of not giving up on their pacific life. Also, uh, the, the nature of kindness, compassion, and empathetic nature which, uh, can be learned. Also, staying grounded and choose uh, they trust to help out the needy ones when when they finally had a contented and prosperous living. With this, I hand over the time to the next person. Thank you. Okay, hello everyone. My name is uh, Rio Krasi of the second semester English department at So College. I belong to Mao tribe. And today the folktale which I'll be sharing with you all is one of the most popular folktale which was told to us by our grandparents. Um, you can find the folktale in, uh, in a magazine. It's called Daniel Magazine from, from the village of Makan. I, I'm from a village called Makan. Okay, so the folktale uh, is, is all about a great warrior called Lukulai. Okay, here goes the story. <clears throat> Lai was uh, from the time when the, head, when the practice of headhunting was prevailing in the land of the Nagas. His mother died giving birth to him, so he grew up under the care of his father. Uh, Lai was physically weak and small child, so his father had to personally take care of him instead of entrusting him to other people. His father would carry him everywhere inside his bag. While his father worked in the fields, uh, he would hang his son uh, on the wall of the hut. Now one day, his father forgot to uh, take his son back home. And it was only in the morning that he realizes that his son was not home. Lai was left all alone um, in the night, uh, at night. And as soon as he realized that, he packed his lunch and rushed back to the field with the feeling of remorse in his heart and no hope of his son being alive. Uh, but to his surprise, when he reached the paddy field, he saw that his son's eyes were wide open and then uh, he was looking all around. Now that was the moment his father told himself that his son was not an ordinary child and then he would leave a great legacy behind. So Lai, he matured into adulthood and he became the strongest man in the village. Now, according to the uh, traditional rules back those days, the strongest man in the village was supposed to protect the village from any uh, external dangers. So that responsibility fell on Lai's shoulder. Many times the enemies from other villages tried to um, attack and kill him, but one way or the other, Lai finds ways to escape from the mouth of death. I would like to share some of those instances where he proved his bravery and, uh, and his warfare intelligence. Okay, oh, one, one instance was, okay, before that, uh, Lai married to a girl from a neighboring village. Today, that village is called Song Song Village. Okay, uh, one day he decided to visit his wife's village um, and his enemies were also from that village. When he entered the village, all the enemies surrounded him and were ready to kill him. The enemies had even closed the village gate. Now, luck was on his side that day as he saw a herd of cattle approaching, uh, approaching him. He took, advantage of the, uh, he took advantage of the herd of cattle. He hid behind the animals, moving from one animal to other. And that was how he escaped from the mouth of death again. From, from that day, the enemies uh, talked to themselves that uh, he was not, she was not a normal and natural being, but he was some sort of a supernatural being. Another, okay, uh, Lai was not only strong, um, fierce, and clever, but he was also a healthy man, a wealthy man. His riches could feed the whole villages, uh, could feed the whole village, uh, and he would throw feasts often. And he also owns huge area of land in the villages of Makan. One day when he was cultivating in one of his fields, he was attacked again by his enemies. He was surrounded. And that day he was alone in the field. There was no way to escape. But an idea struck him. He took out a long piece of cloth and he started waving at them. Now, when the light of the sun reflected on the cloth, it began to shine from one end to the other. Uh, and when the enemy saw that uh, shining piece of cloth, they thought that it was Lai's magical power. And so they felt scared and then they fled the scene. Lai once again uh, tricked his enemies, but actually uh, that long piece of cloth uh, was used as a form of uh, scarecrow to drive um, birds and insects away to avoid uh, the crops being eaten by them. 
And after many failed attempts uh, from his enemies to kill him, the enemies became desperate. And then they decided to destroy lice crops, which were ripened and ready to harvest. The enemies used long ropes and smashed the crops to the ground. Now, when the uh, when Lai saw the ruins of his crop, and I just struck him again, he he decided to fool his enemies. So he placed all his stored rice in the field at night, and in the morning he requested all the villagers to carry those rice from the paddy field to his village to fool the enemies that they had not actually destroyed the crops, but uh, but they have helped Lai multiply his riches. Now, when the enemies saw that, uh, saw the scene of people of people carrying the uh, rice from the paddy field to the village, they got shocked. And then uh, the plan to destroy his riches and kill him was still in vain. Lai, in his idle time, in his spare time, he never stayed idle. He would always patrol the borders of the village. And everywhere he go, he shouts, screams, and his voice would frighten the enemies which prevented uh, from his village uh, getting attacked. Uh, Lai would also climb to the top of the trees to see if enemies are approaching. Now that was how uh, the great warrior Luku Lai, a warfare intelligent and a brave and a brave man, protected the village of the Ikramis and the mountains of the Ikramis. Now who the, who are the Ikramis? Ikramis are the people of Makan villages. That is us. Uh, me, I'm from Makan village, and. To support the authenticity of this fossil, I would like to show you all a picture. Okay, okay um, this picture shows a footprint imprinted on a stone. No one knows how this is possible, but the elders believe that. Uh, Lai was some sort of a supernatural being, and that was how it, was, it is possible. That stone is still there in, in our village till today. Uh, there, there, are two, there are two footprints. One is at Mare, the one which is, um, which is being displayed, and the other is on the way to the forest. This is all about the folktale, and, um, the, folk, and the folktale tells, tells of how a great warrior became a legend. Thank you all very much. Uh, now I would like to give the rest of the time to the last presenter, Bai Mille. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Bai Chilo, a fourth and a grateful student of Tatsu College, uh, who we are very obliged of this weapon and the Zen folklore. I am not, my folklore is about a certain young man, Kelobi of Poilovich. The story believed is true and it has buried on only one village. The tale of Kelobi goes. Aaron Widow was given the guardianship of the Zawar Morrow while her as someone would come visit her and in so to the folks of wrong. Who could what happening for I am a man is dead. One comes to my sleep. Uh, hi for my best sorry for interrupting you. Uh, can you hear me? With all the phone. Yes, uh, sorry for interrupting you, but if you can hear me, can you turn off your camera and start off again because we can barely hear you. I think you have network issues, so if you can do that. Okay. Yes. Good afternoon. I'm okay. Yes, I'm much better. Yes. Okay. So this story is about a certain name, man named Kilobe, uh, who is a, who is from Poilo village. This unique and mythological story is believed to be true, and it has always been buried under only within the village 
until today. The Tale of Kilobe A barren widow had the guardianship of the Mbinta Rahanki, Marang as the chiefess. While her stay at night, someone would come and visit her in her sleep. So she said to the folks, What could be happening for I am a widow? My husband is dead, but someone comes to me in my sleep every night, and I wonder who could that person be. But all the folks denied of being that person, so they decided that they would look out for her. The man fastened and secured all the picket fence gates and took pretense of sleep, putting off the fire and lay guard in their own positions and whispered to her, when you send him leave, tell us. The man came to her that night again, and when he was about to leave, the woman shouted, There he went, and since the folks have covered the entries and guarded the yard, he could not find a way out, so he perched over to Langkup, which means the banister of the front door in the upper edge of the morong, and he walked off in the dark. The man folks could not decipher the strange phenomena and said, yeah, that is not a human, but rather a ghost. How could this be possible? Then in the coming day, the woman found herself conceived with a child. She bare a son, but when his name was to be given, she could not bring about any name with a meaning, for he wasn't a human child. But as a loving mother, she said, For I have asked of him, I shall name him Gilobe, meaning asked. Kilobe grew up in the shelter of the Mbingsa Morong in Poilua as a wealthy man. It was heard that he had a pit in the lower set of his house known as Kilobe in Rikwak, meaning the pit of his wretches. Some said he ate human and would spew on unusual days and there would lay in the pit few remnants of flesh and blood. As he grew older and older and reached the brink of his death, one day he called to his children and said to them, Would you want me to die an aged death and bury me or let me take my own life? For if I take my own life, I can come back and protect my people. But if not, and I die an aged death, I cannot return to defend. But must you make a ritual burial if I am to be buried? His children said, Hey, for it would not be a pleasant thing to say, my mother and father have lost, they have wandered off, so so would you die a well seen days and must we prepare your ritualistic burial? Then he agreed, and on his dying breath he told them, Remember that when I die, do not bury me late. But on the day of his death, the folks quite delayed in taking him to the grave, hence in the midst of preparation, Kelope's dead body became inhumanely unusual, so they feared and hurried him off to the grave, which is also in the set place of his wretches. But came the next morning, and things grew much stranger, for when the people went out to see his grave, there was a great crater, and the ground was hollow. The people gathered and stood at distance and murmured to themselves, saying, Probably, even if we dig for his body, there would be none. He was gone. The tale of Kelobe has been passed down through oral tradition from our ancestor. And for this story, I visited one of the elders of our own clan called Hausum clan, which is also the clan of Kelobe. After the death of this man, Kelobe, before Christianity around May, the clan would perform rituals for seven days before season as a veneration for him. That's the story, everyone. Uh, the students have presented a variety of beautiful folklores of your own tribe. Uh, now we move on to the next part of the session, that is the Q&A session. Uh, if you have any questions that you want to ask to the presenters, please uh, turn on your microphone and ask, or you can even uh, 
use the chat option and ask any questions that you have. I can wait a few more minutes if anyone is willing to ask any questions or if uh, the student has if the students have uh, presented the story well. I think the students have presented quite well, so no questions. I think um, we just want to thank each and everyone for joining us on, in this webinar in our in storytelling, in, uh, uh, in narrating each of their own folklore to the audience. I hope everyone has enjoyed and learned something new about other tribes as well. Um, thank you so much for joining in, everyone. Uh, I think we can conclude with this.